Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Cast all your anxieties on him. That's easy enough. It's easy to do, right? Maybe it's, as uh, someone once said, if it was easy to do, everybody would be doing it. I read a quote from, I believe it was John Knox, the preacher, that once said, when I was young, I was sure of everything. But after a few years, having been mistaken a thousand times, I was not half so sure of the things I was, I was before. And at present, I'm hardly sure of anything except that which God has revealed to me. Life can be confusing. Life can be troubling in thinking about the idea of being humble and trusting. It isn't easy. It can be mistaken. It can be miscommunicated. It can be misinformed. It's a story of a photographer who worked for a national magazine. He was assigned to get photos of a great forest fire that was going on. He was wanting to take some aerial pictures. He asked his office to hire a plane and have a plane ready. They made the arrangements and told him to go at once to a nearby airport where the plane would be found waiting for him. When he arrived at the airport, the plane was warming up on the runway. He jumped in and grabbed his equipment and yelled, let's go, let's go. The pilot swung the plane into the, the air and, and took off. Fly over to the north side of the fire, he said. We'll make three or four low-level passes. Why, the pilot said. Because I'm going to take pictures, cried the photographer. I'm a photographer. That's what photographers do. Now, the pilot paused. He said, you mean you're not the flight instructor? <laughs> we might be unsure of information that we are receiving, information that we have, yet to be humble and rest in the hands of our Lord is how Peter chooses to close out this book. Be humble. Cast your anxieties aside. Even after he has shared with us to be righteous, to seek peace and pursue it on and on, I believe Peter still understands that we will be anxious. We will still have a desire to look inward at self. And he says, no, be humble and rest in the hands of your Lord. So what I want to look at this morning is why is it that uncertainty carries such weight in our lives? If I was so certain about everything, I would rest knowing that God has a plan and I would just do nothing and I would relax, right? Doesn't work. Doesn't for me. But what can we be certain of? What can we lean into with our certainty? We can be sure that God has inspired the writers, the writers of the Bible that, that share the thoughts. Why? Well, can you imagine armies responding to its commander if that general isn't quite sure what he wanted them to do? See, the Bible is sort of like that. It never speaks with timidity. The Bible never says it could be this, it could be that. You might think of this, you might think of that. God's word speaks with certainty. Think about the Bible has answers certain questions. How did life begin? Right? The world says, well, maybe there was a big bang a couple hundred million years ago and somehow it started some evolutionary chain and we started as a tiny blob of primordial sea that evolved into bigger and bigger blobs until finally we had a family of blobs and you see what we are today. Of course, we don't all have the links. We don't all have the answer. It's a fairly uncertain answer. We don't really know how that finishes itself out. But the Bible teaches us. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. God created all forms of life in the sea, in the sky, and on the earth. Then he reached down and fashioned man. He breathed life into his nostrils, and he became a living soul. There's no timidity in that answer. There's no wondering. Another question might be, how did we get into the mess that we find ourselves in today? And I promise you, we are in a mess. How did we get here? Some of the finest minds in the world are trying to figure this out. I read a headline from a news clipping 
it, was a, it was, wasn't just the headline, it was the, the first paragraph, gambling, robbery, sexual immorality, violence are all prevalent. Half of all children are born out of wedlock. Purity and fidelity to the marriage vow are sneered out of fashion. Corruption in politics is rampant. The world is broken. It went on and on and on. Sound familiar, right? That was written in 1694. It's not new, what we are dealing with. But it is prevalent. And there is still just the one answer. Politicians, sociologists, psychologists, psychiatrists all still trying to figure it out. Why is mankind so violent, so immoral? Why is there poverty amongst such wealth? Why are there wars when we're called to love? Why can't we possibly live in peace? We tell people when they pass along to rest in peace. Why don't we live in peace? The world is trying to answer those questions, and some of their answers are interesting. It's the fault of the educational system. There's too much pressure on kids to succeed. It's poverty. If we just spend more money, we could help people out that don't have enough. On and on. You read the same headlines I do. The Bible says there's one answer for why it's like this, and it's our sinful nature. It's the fact that we somehow or other have a bent towards this, and it's unfortunate. Which leads me to a third question, how do we get out of this mess? I guess that's the way I live my life. I try to find ways out of a mess or fix problems. Maybe some of you are like that. You find a problem, you want to fix it. How do we get out of the me mess? Again, all kinds of answers, all kinds of solutions. Gun control, well, that would do it. That would take care of anger. We try to solve unemployment. Everybody working, that would help. And if everybody wanted to work, that would be a good thing. The Bible teaches us that it's so much more than that. The Bible teaches us that not until our hearts and our minds are changed, not until our wills and emotions are changed and refashioned into the image of Christ, it's not until we have been redeemed and forgiven that this planet will be changed for the better. That's the truth. That's what we lean into. Despite what the world says, the Bible says that when we finish this life, if Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, we have the promises of heaven and life. If we accept our Lord, we have the ability to let that Spirit live through us. If we don't, then we don't have that ability. There's no middle ground in the Bible. There's no multiple choices. There's no half-truth, halfway. There's no timidity. The Bible assures us that we have answers for uncertainty. And yet, we look at our world and find uncertainty all over the place. Difficulties. There's a voice of doubt that says, if there is a God, how could he permit all these things to happen? It seems to me that God's people ought to have preferential treatment. I'm a follower. Why in the world are bad things happening? Yet some of God's people suddenly find themselves afflicted with disease, poverty, loss of jobs, loss of family. And so it's easy to conclude for some that there is no God. There's also a voice of knowledge. We have computer banks now that are filled with information. All we have to do is ask the Holy Spirit, which is now Google, and we can tap into anything. We can know it all. We can know what we need to know even to the point where we question the relevancy of religion. The Bible says that the church is here to support and be the pillar of truth. Jesus said, go and love one another so that they will know that you are my followers. That's the pillar, that's the truth. You go to some places and you hear uncertain, timid sounds, messages denying the basics of our faith, the virgin birth, the resurrection, whether Jesus is actually God's son, whether he did die on a cross for our sins or whether it was somehow staged. You'll even hear pastors saying that they don't value the Bible, which is unfortunate. I don't worship the Bible. But it helps me to understand what God is trying to teach me in given moments. 
It helps me to tune my ear that I might understand what the Holy Spirit is teaching me today. The Bible has value. But we need to make sure that we understand how to live that into our lives today. See, because I believe God wants us to be sure of what we know. Sure of what we understand. Sure of what we feel. God doesn't want a half-hearted believer. God wants us all in. Now, God didn't tell me that. But everything that I read, everything I come to understand about those who went before me, they were all in. I'm not going to go through a list of the martyrs, but for someone to be martyred for the faith, you knew they had to be completely invested, completely all in with what they believed the word to be. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. What do we know for sure when we read that? Jesus said, you can know that I'm your shepherd. I know you intimately. I know everything you're thinking. I know every worry, every concern of your life. I have never left you. I will never leave you. Let's hang out so that we can do work together and we can understand together. In Romans 8, Paul says, what do you, so what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose if God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition, exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't do freely for us? Here's what we can know for sure. Paul is saying if God gave us his only begotten son, clearly whatever you ask for is minor in comparison. He goes on in verse 35, he says, do you think, this is Romans 8, 35, do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way, not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed. Let me pause for a moment and you throw yours in there, silently. Whatever we might think could keep us from the love of God. Friends, it doesn't exist. We give attention to things when horrible things happen, like in Charlottesville or in Barcelona. It grabs our attention, but we need to understand as a race, a human race, there is one race. That God's love, nothing can separate us from that. We need to understand that we can all know for sure that what we think is more important than we are something different than the next person is to completely misunderstand what the Bible is teaching us all together. We read earlier from 1 John, this is the testimony in essence. God gave us eternal life, gave us each of us, it's a plural, it's all of us, it's not some of us because we have a different skin color and others, they don't get that. It isn't anything to do with that. God gave us eternal life in his son who died for all. John goes on, my purpose in writing this is very simple. That you who believe in God's son will know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life, the reality, and not some illusion. John wrote in his first epistle so that many would know for sure where they stand and who they are and whose image they were created in so that there is no uncertainty. Everyone it's possible for everyone to have questions. I read a story about Steve McQueen, top billing actor who led a life as tough as the ones he portrayed on the screen, it read. Success filled his life until alcohol and a failed marriage left him empty. In his despair, he attended a crusade led by one of Billy Graham's associates. McQueen made a profession of faith and requested an opportunity to speak with Billy Graham. A 
connecting flight in Los Angeles allowed Dr. Graham to spend a couple of hours with Mr. McQueen in the actor's limousine. Dr. Graham shared numerous scriptures in his quest to give spiritual hope and assurance. Steve McQueen struggled with the thought of a God giving eternal life to a man that had such a checkered past. In Titus 1-2, however, he found a promise that spoke to him. It says, the hope of eternal life which God cannot lie, promised long ages ago. He requested something to write down this verse when he met with Dr. Graham, but Dr. Graham instead gave him his Bible. And it was said that later Steve McQueen died in Mexico while he was seeking experimental treatment for his cancer, and he passed away into eternal life with his finger resting on that verse. You see, what he sought most in his life was a certainty. What he sought more than anything else was, please let me believe that this can be true because the path that I've led doesn't work out so much. Eugene Peterson once said, the, most, the two most difficult things to get straight in life are love and God. More often than not, he says, the mess people make of their lives can be traced to the failure or even stupidity or meanness in one or both of these areas. He said the truth is the basic biblical conviction is that the two subjects are inseparable. They're the same thing. God is love. If we want to deal with God in the right way, we have to learn to love in the right way. If we want to love in the right way, we have to learn to deal with God in the right way. God and love can't be separated. Peter is saying to follow Christ, use that as a foundation for your life. And if you're going to be humble before anything and place anything in the right place, it's do so in God's hands. He's already crafted out a path for you and he wants to walk it with you. Place it in God's hands. It was stretched out for all of us on the cross. Because it's what Jesus has already done for us when he entered Jerusalem and he left king. That we can humbly know our uncertainties are our own and we have answers if we would just find the right place to seek them. What do we know for sure? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I was taught that a long time ago as a child. I'm not sure why sometimes I forget it. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much that you stretched out your hands for us. And all you ask us to do is to humbly place ourselves in those hands. Lord, we want to love. We want to be a loving congregation. We want to be a loving people. We want to be loving parents, grandparents, children, friends. Give us the courage to place our uncertainties in those outstretched hands as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.